Well, if I was going to ask you to name some songs that were to do with money and wealth, I wonder what song you would come up with. Now, just have a think about that at home. Talk to the people around you. Which song have they come up with? I'll give you a moment to do that now. Uh, they thought that. That's interesting that they thought that. Let me tell you, I think six out of ten people will have thought of this song. The chorus goes like this. Money, money, money. Must be funny in a rich man's world. Money, money, money. Always sunny in a rich man's world. Aha, aha. That's how it goes. Um, of course, it is ABBA's 1978 hit, Money, Money, Money. And uh, the, the, the verses um, talk about their experience, which probably isn't really their experience now because they will have an awful lot of money. But, um, but then they were working a job as a waitress and longing to be picked up by some wealthy man so that they could enjoy all that money, money, money. And the wonderful thing is uh, money, the chorus tells us, enables you to laugh in any situation in life. And also money protects you from the storms of life because it must be sunny in a rich man's world. And I don't know how much of that song was tongue in cheek, but I guess there's a little bit of all of us that looks on and thinks money really is the answer. Uh, maybe some of you came up with another song that was out in 2015 by Lunch Money Lewis called Bills. And um, the video to this, this song is quite funny as he kind of sings from a room where he is up to his neck in paper bills. And he sings, I've got bills, I've got to pay. And so I've got to work, work, work every day. And the reality is for both those songs, it is that. It is money is going to make the difference. I wonder how are you feeling about money? I remember when uh, I used to work in a very affluent um, area, the church in a very affluent area. One of the people in this church was who owned two really big houses uh, and had a boat in the south of France said, oh yeah, he was telling us about someone else who had an even bigger boat. And I think to fill this boat up cost um, 20,000 pounds in terms of fuel. It was a huge boat. And he, he was just saying, it's a different world, isn't it? And I remember looking at him and thinking, you say that's a different world? You're in a different world. What planet are you on? You see, wherever we are on the ladder, there will always be people that we look up to and think, it's a different world. And there'll always be people, if you like, below us who look up to us and think, it's a different world. Look at their wealth. Look at how much they have. You see, there'll always be people who have more than us. There'll always be people who have less than us. But money can absolutely consume our hearts. And let's face it, right now, uh, we're in a place where we're all a bit, little bit anxious about money. You know, with, with the furlough scheme ending and the impact of the sh lockdown and, and COVID-19 and thinking, how is my business going to keep working? Am I going to get a job? How am I going to pay the bills, bills, bills? It's quite stressful. It's quite anxious. And, you know, it may not be us, but it may be our friends or our family or our nephews or our nieces. And you're thinking, oh, my children, how are they going to cope? This is not an easy time with regards to wealth and money. And so what does God have to say about it? Now look, um, the passages we are going to look at today do not answer the financial crisis that we are currently in. So if you know Rishi, um, then this talk's not going to help him, but you'll still quite enjoy it. So forward on the talk to Rishi, I think you'll find it really helpful. But there are, there are three big things. Um, that Proverbs tells us about wealth that helps us navigate through some of the issues that we're going to be leaning into and the issues that we always face with regards to wealth. And the first thing is this, and I think this is a kind of surprising thing. God made wealth and it's to be prized. You see, the Proverbs actually have a really positive 
view on money and wealth. That's something that Gary brought out in his talk on generosity, which was a few weeks ago. And if you haven't heard it, go and listen to it. It's a brilliant talk. Well, listen to this uh, from Proverbs 10 verse 22. Uh, the blessing of the Lord brings wealth without painful toil for it. See, half the times uh, the word wealth is used in Proverbs, it, it says it's to be prized. And the other half of the times that wealth is used in Proverbs, we are challenged not to trust it. And there is the challenging nuance for us all. Now, it kind of makes sense that wealth is seen by God as a good thing. Because we've got to understand the worldview within which Proverbs was written. And it, and it comes out of Genesis chapter 1. Uh, verse 31, listen to this. Um, God saw everything at the end of the creation account. God saw everything he had made. And behold, it was very good. You see, God created everything in this world. Uh, he stuffed it full of colossal opportunities to develop and create and make wealth. You know, I, I know uh, that there were, there was black gold in those valleys. Sadly, uh, it dried up. But we know that the magnificent animals God has made that both can feed us and can be used to clothe us. And I guess that probably would have helped with the shoemakers that used to be all based in Norwich. Now it's just Aviva, but that's fine. They make wealth in another way. See, the the world, even before sin entered in, had magnificent potential. Genesis chapter 2 verses 11 and 12 tells us this. It tells us about a river that winds through um, the river Pishon and it winds through the entire land of Havila where there is gold. The gold, that, the gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. And Ray Ortland points out, um, in his commentary that God here, he hasn't distributed this gold equally all across the world. No, he's put it in the land of Havila. It's there for them and that they've got the potential to get very, very rich. But why has God done that? Well, he's done that so that in his words, they can share with others and become like God himself, the ultimate sharer. See, God's made a wonderful world. And the wealth in the world is for our good. But the thing Proverbs highlights again and again and again is that it is not to be trusted. It's not where we're to put our full weight of confidence and our hope in life. If you do that, you're a fool. See, the wealth in the world is there to point us to the even greater gift. If that is that wealth is this wonderful, how much greater, how much more wealth is in the God who created it all? He's the one in whom we're to hope. See, there's the first point, really a more broad point from the book of Proverbs. Um, wealth is not bad, it is good, it's to be prized. But I guess the second big thing, as I've already highlighted, wealth really is not to be trusted. And there are three um, Proverbs we're going to look at which highlights some of the issues with wealth and the first one is that wealth actually does bring some problems of its own. Look at Proverbs chapter 13 verse 8. A person's riches may ransom their life but the poor cannot respond to threatening rebukes. Now on first view this proverb seems to say that actually wealth is a really good thing because um, wealth means that you can pay a ransom if you've been kidnapped, whereas actually someone who's poor can't even respond very well to rebuke. But actually, when you start digging into that, it's saying there is a different level of threat to having wealth than to having poor, being poor, because all of a sudden you have a reason if you have wealth to be kidnapped and have to pay a ransom, whereas a poor person will never have that threat. I once used to live in a um, very um, wealthy area, as I said, and this was a place that literally there were premiership footballers there, Arsenal players, Tottenham players, um, there were city bankers, there were celebrities, Cheryl Cole lived up the road for a little while, um, a very rich place. 
And as you drove down these streets with these absolutely enormous houses, you'd look in and you'd drool at these cars like, like two or three Ferraris on their front drive. But the other thing, you know, off the initial living there, as I um, lived there for a bit longer, I was living in a vicarage. I was um, a student at a Bible college working for the church that was in this parish. It's not that I am secretly very, very rich, although I am in Christ. That's another story. Anyway, um, as you walked around this area, uh, you could be jealous of all these Ferraris, but then you realised they were everywhere, had massive gates. And there was a security firm a private security firm that everyone chipped in to pay for because they all had stuff that was actually worth nicking. They all had stuff they had to protect. Uh, John Kitchen in his commentary puts it like this, the one who has nothing to lose is more secure than that the one who has much to protect. Riches don't bring security, contentment does. See, riches can bring headaches of their own. But also, wealth is not guaranteed forever. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not guaranteed. Have a look at Proverbs 27, 23 to 27. This is what it says. Be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds. For riches do not endure forever, and a crown is not secure for all generations. When the hay is removed and the new growth appears, then the grass from the hills are gathered in. The lambs will provide you with clothing, and the goats for the price of a field. You will have plenty of goat's milk to feed your family and nourish your female servants. You see here, um, there's a warning, isn't there? Uh, back in verse 23, be sure to give attention to your flocks. Be careful uh, to pay attention to your herd. The point it's making is that, you know, our wealth won't, it doesn't always just, it doesn't carry on. It doesn't keep on going. You do need to maintain it. You know, if you get so far away from your business, you may not know what actual shape it is in. And if you want wealth to keep providing, you need to have some form of diligence. If you want to be able to do the stuff of 25 to 27, feed your family, uh, clothe your family, then actually you need to keep looking at wealth. Why? Because verse 24, riches don't endure forever. The crown is not secure for all generations. William and Harry, take note. See, wealth and prosperity um, in every generation needs to be worked for and it needs to be developed and it needs to be put to work. See, money earned by a parent can be squandered by a child. Uh, just because you're born into something uh, doesn't mean that you're going to be, you're always going to have it. Check the flock, pay careful attention. Again, he's just saying here that money has to be worked for, but it is not something to put your trust in maintain it. Now look, there is, a, there is a side point here. There's a principle that's really helpful for us and I think that just sort of fits in every aspect of life. And I was just thinking for us as a church, you know, we've got an astonishing legacy as Surrey Chapel of, you know, 150 years, is it? 125, 150 years of faithful gospel ministry. We can look back and say, wow God, look at all you've done. But this is saying, be careful, pay attention to your flocks. Don't assume it'll always be like this. Uh, you've got to keep pushing on. You've got to keep investing in people. You've got to keep sharing the gospel. You can't just keep doing the things and things of the past without investing in the, the future and the people who are going to lead the church in years to come and protect the gospel by sharing it. You know, it's really isn't it easy, isn't it, to get involved in a ministry area and become really brilliant at it but then never actually train anyone else to take over from you. And when you finish it, it all collapses. And that's not what we're about. We're about investing in the flock, investing in people, investing in the gospel so that it endures. So the church keeps enduring in each generation, faithfully preaching the gospel. Anyway, that is a side rant. The main thing is money it doesn't go on forever finally proverbs 22 verse 1 um, a good name is more desirable than great riches to be esteemed is better than silver or gold you see there are some things that are more important than a bottom line 
you know, then eking out that little bit of extra profit. And actually, the honor of your name matters. And it really matters if you're known as a Christian in business. You know, I remember watching an episode of The Apprentice. Um, this is with Alan Sugar, not Donald Trump, the American one. That's a very different thing. And um, there was this challenge where they had to go and make sandwiches for a bunch of city workers. And uh, this one team, uh, they, they had a load of orders in and they made some appalling quality sandwiches. I mean, it was awful. You know, they, they promised the world and they gave them like jam on bread. And you could see these workers were utterly dissatisfied. But this team ended up winning the task. Why? Because they made an incredible profit. Now, the reality of that, it was total false economy because they try to cut, you know, they try to cut the standards and they made loads of money. But no one's going to want to buy sandwiches from them again. Of course they're not. That was just absolutely appalling business news because they they were given substandard quality and trying to get away with it. It's all about the bottom line. It's all about trying to make loads of money. And actually he was saying, you know, actually there are some things that are more important than wealth and money. And actually your name matters, particularly if you're a Christian and you're in business. You know, how do you deal with people? Do you deal with the people in a way that is fair? And of course it's, it's not wrong to make money, but how do you do that? Do you do that in a way that honors God? See, wealth here can be a problem. Uh, it can be a snare. It's not something here that we are to put all our weight in. There are more important things. And so the final thing is a prayer in the book of Proverbs that helps us with our perspective on money. So the third thing is we need to pray that our wealth will not get in the way of us trusting God. At the end of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 30, uh, verse 7 to 9, uh, we read a prayer, the only prayer in the whole book of Proverbs from King Lemuel. And this is how it goes. Two things I ask you, Lord, do not refuse me them before I die. Keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. You see King Lemuel here, he's a wise king and he says that there's two things uh, that will cause me to stumble in life. One is lies and the other one is too much or too little wealth. Uh, now lies can be a mess for all of us. None of us want to leave, live a deceived life. Um, but I guess the, you know, when you think about wealth, you know, just think about the parable of the sower. And uh, there is Jesus talking about soul number three. And what is the thing that chokes uh, one of um, those bits of grain that is growing up? What is one of the weeds that chokes it to death? It is the deceitfulness of wealth. You see, wealth can lie to us. You know, in the, the language of Proverbs, uh, so often people think wealth is my fortress. It is what keeps me safe. Uh, it's what's going to sort me out. Um, that insurance policy, my, in, my money that is saved in the bank, all of that. And yet, Proverbs 11 verse 4 says this, wealth is worthless in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers me from death. See there, the pride to be delivered from the deceitfulness of wealth is to be able to see through it, to see its limitations, to see that it will not last at all. And actually when it comes to the day of judgment, wealth will not help us. It will not matter how poor or how rich you have been. Actually, the only thing that will matter there is righteousness. You know, that's why um, the second prayer is, is just a brilliant prayer. Don't give me so much that I think I am self-sufficient and I don't need you. And I think, who is the Lord? Don't give me so little that I have to dishonor your name and steal. Um, both those things are disaster. Just give me what I need. And so 
You know, I wonder where you are on that. I wonder if that's a prayer you pray. And I wonder where your confidence is. And I guess for some of us watching this, we'll think, well, look, I really don't have enough. And actually, I am tempted to steal. And Lord, give me what I need. But there'll be others of us who, most of us really, we're not desperately worried by our daily bread. Because actually, we do have resources. And that will be lots of us. And we've just got to say that, King Lemuel says, maybe you're in danger. In danger of putting confidence in the wrong place, in wealth and riches, rather than the Lord, who's the only one um, who could deliver us on the day of wrath. It's interesting, isn't it, when it says, uh, wealth will not help you on the day of wrath, on the day of God's just judgment against our sin, righteousness will. And that is the point at which I guess all of us should be a little bit concerned. Because as we've considered about wealth, all of us will have thought, actually, there's times where I've been really envious of others. Uh, there's times where I've been driven to do things, maybe even stealing, filling my tax return, whatever it may be. Uh, there's times where I really have not felt content in my situation and I've felt anger and bitter at others because of their financial situation. You see, none of us have a righteousness that can actually stand on that final day. But the glorious thing is that Proverbs points us to the king who always was perfectly content, perfectly generous, never got money out of perspective. And he willingly lived the perfect life and Jesus died the death that we deserve. He was willing to die for selfish people who have not been content and not looked to him alone for provision so that we can have a righteousness and a confidence before God if we will trust him with our sin and turn away from our selfishness and greed and follow him. See, how are you doing with money? You know, how is money going for you? How's wealth? Where is your confidence today? See, money, money, money must be funny in a rich man's world. I guess that is a lot of us. But let's pray that we won't be deceived and we will carry on trusting the Lord and be generous with the wealth that he has given us. Let me pray. Look, God, we just want to thank you for how practical and how useful your word is. And Father, pray you'll keep us from being um, overly self-righteous about money and wealth. Father, thank you that actually it is part of your good creation. It is part of your good um, gift to us in this wonderful world. And yet, sorry for um, so much, so many times where we just get it totally out of perspective and we even become jealous or we become um, satisfied in ourselves and we end up trusting money rather than you. Father, thank you so much that you gave the Lord Jesus to die for us, to forgive us and to bring us contentment and hope and um, genuine hope in the light of death and wrath where money cannot help us. And so Father, pray you help us to be a church that keeps the right perspective on wealth and use it in a way that is wise and not like fools. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.